year for Israeli mathematics. Um, two of the highest distinctions in mathematics, the Abel Prize and the Shaw Prize are awarded to two members of the community. And I can't think of a better place to celebrate it than the meeting of the IMU. So I will, uh, I'll be giving a talk about uh, Hila's work. It's a really great honor for me to be giving this talk. Um, Hillel is one of the founding figures of the amazing dynamic school in Jerusalem and has had an enormous impact on Israeli mathematics and his contributions are remarkably broad and you can also see this in the, in the, the research areas of his many students. I also can proudly say that I'm related to Hillel mathematically in two ways. So first I'm his mathematical daughter because uh, uh, I'm a student but also um, uh, my father's advisor, which was Sam Carlin and Hillel are uh, mathematical brothers. They're both students of uh, Salomon Bochne. So he's also my distant mathematical cousin or something like that. <clears throat> anyway, so, um, so let me start. I hope, uh, wait, um, it's taking some time to respond. Uh, it did, res oh, okay, right, okay. So, um, so with, while preparing this talk, I was thinking to myself, uh, what is the first, uh, or what, what comes to my mind when I think about uh, Hillel's work? And, and I, think, uh, I think the word beauty is the first, that, first word that came to my mind. His work is really um, beautiful, like uh, great art is. And, and I, his paper is like, uh, like gems, and I collected a few gems. I call this slide, First to Bring Gems, just to, pre to, to present some of them on this slide over here. Uh, I'll try to explain some of them in the, I only have a half an hour, so I'll try to, try to explain some of them in the, in the time to come. I actually didn't see when I start, so I hope I, okay, never mind. Um, anyway, okay. So, uh, um, so here's, a, here's kind of the first, uh, the first gem I want to start with. Uh, it's a very short note, which was written by, by Frisenberg when he was 20, so 1955. And it's, a, it's a beautiful proof he discovered for the infinitude of primes. Uh, it made it to the proofs from the book, book of Ziegler, not related <laughs> to me, but Gundel Ziegler, Gundel Ziegler. Um, and, uh, uh, I tell my, I give this proof in my topology class. Usually I tell my students that, uh, first of all, proves this when he was 20, so no pressure. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> any, any talk should, uh, should contain a, a proof. So this is actually a proof I can give the, the whole, the entire paper is this very small paragraph over here. So how do we prove, we want to show that there are infinitely many primes, then, um, we, def we introduce a topology on the integers given by the basis um, the, the basis to the topology is given by arithmetic progressions by these n a b so a plus n b n and c so b is not zero, and um, we make the two observations. One is that uh, any not empty set is infinite. This is clear, and uh, and the second is that uh, that these arithmetic progressions n a b are closed sets. They're clearly open, but also closed because the complementary of any arithmetic progression is a finite unit union of arithmetic progressions. And now we come to the punchline. Well, if any number that is not plus or minus one has a prime factor, so I can write Z minus the set plus minus one as a union of arithmetic progressions over primes. Now, if there were only finitely many primes, then the right-hand side would be a closed set, but then plus minus one would be an open set, which contradicts the fact that it should be infinite. So this is a, it's a really beautiful proof. And anyway, okay, so this is my, this is a, uh, my first gem. Uh, but, uh, uh, but now, uh, oh, I don't know why this is getting stuck. So this is um, somehow not responding to my, uh, my uh, iPad is not responding. I don't know. Maybe you should refresh it. Maybe, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so we'll see how this goes. Um, maybe I should move, move it more often. Anyway, so I was trying to choose, I had to choose, um, I, as I said, I have a small amount of time. I had to choose um, some, I tried to choose some topics that, uh, um, 
well, I, the, to, to cover some of some, uh, there's no chance I can cover Hilla's entire um, body of work, but I think like maybe the, the theme of, of, of the talk will be that dynamics is everywhere. Um, one of the very, the beautiful contributions is that Hilla introduced dynamics to very many uh, areas of mathematics, to combinatorics, number theory, group theory, uh, operator algebras. And um, so I, what, I, what I did choose, so I chose three topics that had a, a rather unexpected or maybe turn unexpected developments in the 21st century. So I'll, there, there were uh, uh, I, ideas from, from uh, Furstenberg that had really uh, unexpected, uh, unexpected turn events in the 21st century. Anyway, so what is the, in dynamics, so what is the, just a, this is a slide about the context. So dynamics, we have a set X and a transformation T from X to itself. And this is really not gonna work. Uh, I'm not sure what I, what I should do with this. I should, maybe I should stop talking and just move the slides. Maybe you try to switch off and switch on. Yeah, maybe I'll try to do that. Let me. I would blame the kids that the kids are on the internet, but that's false. So, <laughs> so I can't blame anyone. <laughs> I can't blame anyone but myself uh, uh, for, for it this. Works. It works? Not now. Yes, no. Ah, okay. So, okay, I'll try to speak quickly. So a dynamical system is set to, a set to X and transformation T from X to X. So there are very uh, various contexts in which we can, in which one can talk about it, depending on the structure on, you want to put on the set X. And we'll be interested in, in two structures. One is the structure in topological dynamics, where X is a topological space and T is continuous. And the second one is ergodic theory, where you, the structure is a measure space and, and T is what is, no, what is called a measure preserving transformation. So it, mu of t inverse b is b for any measurable set b. And if you haven't seen this before, maybe just two, two examples to keep in mind. One, um, you can take x to be z mod mz. This is a finite set and with a uniform measure. And think of tx as just x plus 1 mod m. So you can think of it, if you want, as a both topological or, or, or a, a measurable um, dynamical system. And similarly, you can take the set X to be 0, 1 to the Z. So these are all sequences, um, 0, 1 sequences. And you look at the product measure, and then your transformation T is shifting. So you take a sequence and you shift it to the left, say. Um, and just uh, two, two basic constructions. One, uh, one is uh, the, the will come up is one is a one is a factor a fact or what is known as factor in dynamics this is a morphism in the context of measure preserving systems and and there's also a very natural construction of a product so if you have two systems you can look at the product system with a product with the action of the product of, of the transformations and uh, and the product measure or if it, if, if just a topological case, uh, set then then ignore the measure um, maybe I should also say that T, I write T in the transformation, but could also be represented as a group or a semi-group acting on the space X. Okay, so here is, here is, here is the first topic that I chose. It's the paper of, of, uh, of Furstenberg from uh, 1967. It's called Disjointness in Ergodic Theory, Minimal Sets and Problems in Geofantan Approximation. And, and in it, he, he, he discusses uh, the following problem. So here's a, like a very simple dynamical system. It's called the times n map. So you have the torus and you look at a point x and x goes to n times x. You multiply it by x, you look mod one. This is the times n map. n is an integer. And, uh, and this system is very rich in the sense that it has many invariant measures and many invariant subsets. But, um, but first of all, made this observation in 1967 that that it becomes very rigid, the system becomes very rigid once you take two of these maps interacting between each other. So the theorem is that if you take a closed subset of the torus that is invariant both under times two and under times three, then, then there are very, very few choices of that. Either it has to be the, the torus or it has to be finite, and then it's just a subset of, of Q. And, um, and this type to, to prove this theorem, um, or it, what he does in this, this, this theorem is an application of the entire theory that is developed 
in this paper, and this is um, the theory of disjointness or, or in, in general of joinings. So what is a joining of, of, of dynamical systems? So suppose you have a, two dynamical systems, X and Y, and, um, and you have, a, a, so what is a joining of the two of them? In the topological context, it would be uh, uh, a subset of the product system who's, um, who, that projects on X and on Y. And an invariant, sorry, an invariant closed subset of the product system that projects on X and Y. In the measure preserving uh, uh, context, it would be uh, uh, an invariant measure on the product system whose marginals are the measure on X, the original measure on X, and the original measure on Y. And, and, and the point is, um, and you can define a notion of disjointness when are two systems disjoint if. Um, if uh, the only joining is, uh, is the trivial joining. The only way you can join in the, what's the trivial joining is just the product, just the product of the two systems. Um, so for those of you who like diagrams, you say that X and Y is, are disjoint if, if you, whenever you have a map, I don't know if you see my, do you see my mouse? Maybe, maybe not. Whenever you have a map from Z to X, yes, yes. from we'll Z to Y, can you see it? And yes. whenever you have a map from Z to X and a map from Z to Y, then, then, then you get a map from Z to um, X times Y so that this, this diagram commutes. Um, for example, in the measure theoretic context, it would tell you that if you pull back the sigma algebra in X and the sigma algebra in Y into, the, into X times Y, then these are independent. And then you say that the system are disjoint and, and the, 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 the thing behind the theorem of Furstenberg is that times two and times three are so different that there is no non-trivial coupling between them. There's no non-trivial joining between these two systems. Um, oh, right. So, so in this, uh, uh, again, again, this is not responding, damn it. Um, okay. Uh, why is this not responding? Uh, it's very, uh, I feel uh, technologically impaired. Um, Can you try to make it work on the laptop? I'm gonna do, yeah, I'm gonna do, so wait, if this, this last chance I'm giving this, and, and if it's uh, not gonna work, then I'm just gonna, um, I'm just gonna reopen this on my computer. I just did it on my iPad and obviously this is not working. So hang on one second. It's, uh, um, so I'm stopping this, I'll open. Uh, I'm, and, by iPad. Okay, uh, this is working much better. <laughs> I should have done this to begin with. I thought I was kind of being uh, with this iPad. <laughs> anyway, in the same paper, uh, uh, Furstenberg uh, introduces uh, uh, this, this conjecture, which is called the time, times two times three conjecture. Actually, it's a conjecture about any two integers, take, call an N, N and M, say that they're multiplicatively independent if log n divided by log m is not in q. And, and the famous conjecture of, of Furstenberg is similar to the theorem we proved before, but in the measure theoretic context. So the conjecture is that any Borel measure mu on the torus, which is an ergodic Borel measure on the torus, which is invariant under the, both the semigroup generated by times n and the semigroup generated by times m, is either the Lebesgue measure or an atomic measure that is supported in finitely many rational points. And, um, and this, this, this conjecture has had a, uh, an enormous impact on, on mathematics. Um, uh, let me mention kind of two, two directions. Um, uh, one of them is about um, algebraic actions on, uh, in homogeneous spaces and, and relation to Diophantine questions. So, so uh, uh, so there's a very well-known conjecture, it's the Littlewood conjecture, it states that for any alpha and beta um, uh, real numbers, um, any two numbers can be 
um, relatively well simultaneously approximated by a rational number with the same denominator. So this is, this is the statement behind the lim inf over n times n alpha. The, the norm there is the distance to, to the integers. So n times the norm of n alpha times the norm of n beta is zero. And uh, a very well-known theorem of Einstein's Elish, Nina Stoss, and Kotok from um, 2006 says that the exceptions to the Littlewood conjecture is the set of exceptions, the set of bad alpha betas is a house of dimension zero. And, uh, and another, uh, another, uh, another direction is in fractal geometry. Um, so, uh, so first of all, I conjectured this, this time, conjectured this times n times n conjecture in, in various contexts. And, uh, and one of the, one of his, one of the context, one of the, uh, one of the contexts was uh, fractal geometry. So, and, or in the study of cell, self similar sets. And um, so, so the follow, he conjectured the following, that if you have uh, two sets A and B that are TP, TQ, respectively, so A is TP invariant and B is TQ invariant, and you have an affine map from R to R, then, um, then uh, so, and P and Q are, P and Q should be N and M, they're multiplicatively independent, then uh, the Hausdorff dimension of A, the intersection of A and G of B is small or equal than, than the sum, the maximum between the sum of the dimensions minus one and zero. And this was very recently proved um, uh, by, independently by uh, Schmelking, uh, Pavel Schmelking, um, building on work of uh, Mike Kochmann and, uh, and independently by different methods by uh, Mengru in just very recently, 2019. Okay, so this is, this is for me, this is kind of the, uh, maybe this is, this, these are the things that maybe Furstenberg had in mind that when, when, he, when he introduced this, this, this the theory of disjointness. But as I said, I want to introduce kind of an unexpected direction that took, that took place in recent years. Um, so this is, uh, this is related to this uh, uh, notion of uh, this function from number theory called the Mobius function. So what is, who, what is the Mobius function? It's this function that takes the value minus one to the k if n is a product of k to string primes and zero otherwise. And, um, uh, and there's this kind of vague principle in number theory that says that, uh, uh, that the Mobius function should behave like a random function. But it's a very vague principle and what exactly this randomness should mean is not entirely clear or not entirely well defined. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, but you can, so, so what you can, what you can try to do is kind of put this, um, in a dynamical context. So think of the Mobius function as a sequence of zero plus and plus minus one. So it's a sequence in, in zero plus one minus one to the n. And now think of the shift space. So you have this transformation that looks at shifts to the left. Okay. So, so you think of the Mobius function as a sequence and you look at this, um, shift, and you can look at what is you can you can look at a, a flow at the topological dynamical system, which is the Mobius flow. So this is the the, the x, x is is the closure of the orbit of t to the n u of this shift uh, of the shift. And uh, and in for, in topological dynamics, there is a there is a way to try to measure a complexity of the system. This is um, this is the topological entropy. And, and you say that a flow is deterministic if it uh, has zero topological entropy. And about 10 years ago, um, Sarnak uh, uh, tried to give a, 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 a rigorous, uh, kind of a, a rigorous uh, statement for what Mobius randomness uh, can be. And he conjectured, inspired by Furstenberg's work, um, by this paper that I described before, that the Mobius flow should be disjoint from any deterministic flow, and this uh, this has, there's a uh, uh, this direction of research has there's a, a, a huge flow a huge uh, uh, body of work in the last ten years uh, in this uh, in this direction. Okay, so uh, I don't know how am I doing time wise. Badly, <laughs> very badly. Okay, so this is <laughs> me on a double speed. Uh, it's so, take so five more minutes. So it's okay. Uh, so, so second second topic I want to talk about is uh, is the boundary theory. Um, so, so, so this is a very known problem of Dirichlet. Is uh, I suppose you're given a, a a function on the unit circle, so you can think of it as a 
as temperature in the unit circle, and, um, and you want to determine the temperature inside the disk. This is known as the Dirichlet's problem. So you want to solve a PDE given the values, the heat equation given the, the values on the boundary. And, uh, and it's well known that the solution is, is a harmonic function, and it's given by uh, what is known as the Poisson formula. So this is the formula that I wrote to you, um, that I wrote to you over here. Um, and um, and first, I'm going to observe that that actually you can um, you can think of this uh, you can think of this formula um, instead of as a formula on the unit circle, you can think of it as a formula on a group. In this case, the group of the Mobius transformations on the unit disk. Um, so if G is the group of Mobius transformations on the unit disk and H is a harmonic function on, on the unit disk, then you can define a function on the group. So you can define this function H tilde of G, which is given by the value of H at G of zero. And then this, this integral that you, see, that you see on top takes a very pleasant form. It's just the integral of the unit circle of this H hat G zeta D M zeta, where M is just a harm measure on the unit circle. And, uh, and th I'm guessing that this motivated him to, to define a general, so, so you want to think in this way, you want to think of the circle as the boundary of the group of Mobius transformations. Um, and, and this motivated, I'm guessing, <laughs> him uh, to, uh, to define a general boundary theory for, for groups. So, so let me describe it to you. So suppose you have a G is a semi-simple Lie group and you use a probability measure on G. Um, then you can define, uh, then, then you can say what is a harmonic function on G, so related to the, the measure mu. So what is, when do you say that a function H is mu harmonic? You say that if it satisfies the mean value property with respect to mu, so at any point G, H of G is the integral of H G G prime D mu G prime. And, and then um, the first word boundary is the, the classification space for harmonic functions. So there exists a, 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 a compact G space, pi, and the measure nu, such that any, um, any, harmonic, any mu harmonic functions, that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between mu harmonic functions and bounded functions on this boundary. Um, and, and not only that, but actually you can have a representation for this for any such harmonic function as, uh, as a, this sim similar integral like I had before, like the integral over h hat of g p d mu p, where uh, for for a bounded function on the on the boundary. Um, and and so so in this paper he develops this this theory of, of boundary for groups and and. Um, also, a few years later, or, or in, in this paper as well, um, makes uh, the observation that actually this boundary can tell you many things about the group, or you can actually try to answer purely algebraic questions about groups using this boundary theory. So, for example, um, suppose you have a, a, a Lie group G, you'd say that it's an envelope of gamma um, if gamma is isomorphic to a lattice of G. And this is, you know, if, if gamma is a lattice in G or not lattice in G, this is an algebraic question. And, uh, and first, I'm going to prove that in 1967, that a kind of a rigidity result for lattices. So we showed that SL2R and SL3R can't envelope the same discrete group. Um, and, and essentially, the reason is because the boundaries of SL2R and SL3R are distinct. Use boundary theory to prove this, um, and this is you can think of it as a as, as a one theorem in, in, in beginning of theorems in rigidity of uh, of rigidity properties of groups and lattices. So suppose you have an uh, you have an isomorphism between two lattices, two discrete groups, gamma one and gamma two, and can you what does it say or does it extend to an isomorphism between between the envelopes G one and G two? So this is this is. Um, very uh, uh, basic, very interesting question, and you can think of Furstenberg. There, there are many results in, 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 in this direction, very, very famous one. Let me mention two of them. One is what, what is known as the Mostov um, rigidity theory. Um, uh, yeah, I'm probably, I'm sorry. And uh, which says that the geometry of a complete finite volume hyperbolic manifold of dimension greater than two is determined by the fundamental group. And, and the second one is the Margulis superrigidity theorem that tells you, or under what conditions you can um, extend representations of gamma to, uh, 
to, uh, to repres continuous representations on the group G. So this is, a, this, is a, this is one direction of this boundary theory, but again, I wanna say here is a completely uh, different direction in the last few years. Um, and so, so uh, 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 in, in operator algebras, so, uh, uh, and I thank uh, Uri Bader for bringing this to my attention. Uh, so, uh, uh, so suppose you have a discrete group gamma and, and lambda is the left regular representation on L2 gamma, um, then, um, then you can define the notion of a reduced C star algebra. So this is, um, this is CR gamma. So this is the norm closure of the group algebra C gamma in the bounded operator on L2 gamma. And, and you say that the, that the group's gamma is C star simple if, uh, if the reduced algebra is uh, C star algebra is simple. And it's a well-known long-standing open question to uh, try to understand which groups are C star simple. And, uh, and it was recently, 2014, proved by Callanter and Kennedy that, um, that a group is C star simple if and only if the gamma action on the first term of the boundary is topologically free. So they related the property of, of C star simplicity to, um, to, to an action on the Furstenberg boundary. Um, maybe, maybe yet further, um, uh, one, can, one can say that gamma has the unique trace property if the only trace, so the only unique trace for gamma is again the property of the reduced um, C star algebra CR gamma. If the only trace is the canonical trace, there's a notion of canonical trace, and you can ask when this is the only trace on the, um, on the reduced uh, uh, C star algebra. And, uh, and again, this was this a long-standing open question, which groups have the unique trace property? And it was shown by, uh, by uh, Brouillard, Callanter, Kennedy, and Ozawa in 2016 that every C star simple group has a, the unique trace property. And again, and this was using this, 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 um, this uh, uh, first row boundary criterion that was developed by Callanter and Kennedy, expanding on that in 2014. So this is again a, a kind of a completely different direction in, in operator algebras in very recent years. Uh, so, okay, five minutes. Uh, so finally, uh, last, uh, uh, last, last topic I want to talk about is, is, uh, is that of uh, ergodic Ramsey theory. So there's a, a beautiful theorem of Semiretti from 1975, the following that um, if E is a subset of N of positive density, then, um, then E contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progression. So positive density just means that you take a positive proportion of growing intervals, okay, of, 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 uh, uh, of, uh, of long intervals. And, uh, uh, and in 1977, um, Furstenberg gave uh, an alternative proof for Semmerit. So Semmerit's proof was, uh, was uh, graph theoretic, and, and Furstenberg gave uh, an alternative proof for Semmerit's theorem um, using ergodic theory. So his first step was to translate the question to a question in ergodic theory. This is now known as the Furstenberg correspondence principle and, and says that if you have a, uh, the following, so suppose you have a set of positive density in the integers or in the natural numbers, then, then you can associate to it um, a measure preserving system, xb mu and transformation t, and a, a distinguished set A with positive measure, such that the following holds, um, if the measure of the intersection of A with T minus N one A up to T minus N K of A is positive, this means that if you think about it, if you have the set, you have the set A and you're trying, you're, you're, you're trying to estimate your return times to the set A, then, um, then if, you, if, you, if, you, if you manage to find a tuple N one through N K so that this holds, then this actually holds for the original set in the integers E. That means that the intersection of E with its translates by N1 through NK is not empty. It's exactly like saying that X, X plus N1 up to X plus NK is inside the set E. And, uh, and to prove Samaretti theorem, Furstenberg showed that, uh, that if you look at the limb inf of the average of, so, so you have an average here of mu of the intersection of A with T minus NA through T minus K and A, if you, 
look at this, this intersection if, and you translate it through the correspondence principle to the set A, this is exactly finding such a non-trivial n, a non-zero n says that you have a k plus one term arithmetic progression inside your set E. So, so if you prove, so, th so this, this multiple recurrence theorem of theorem proves, gives another proof for a Samaradi's theorem. And this, uh, there are many ideas in this proof. I wanna highlight two of them. Um, one is that, uh, um, that one, of, one, of, one of the new ideas there was that um, prior to that, dynamical systems were mainly studied via subsystems. So you have a complicated system, you maybe chop it up into subsystems, try to understand that. And the, the idea that comes in this proof is to try to understand the system through its morphisms to simpler systems, to, to simpler um, measure preserving systems. So this is one, and, and the second is the feature um, of the dichotomy between randomness and structure, which also appears in, 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 in other proofs of uh, San Moretti's theorem. In the dynamical context, you can think of it as if your set E were random to some extent, and then, then the set A you would produce from it, you would expect it that this intersection, the, the intersection of that the, these sets A, T minus N, A, A, N A up to T minus K and A would become asymptotically independent. So you would expect this average to converge to mu of A to the K plus one. And, and the thing is that if this, but this doesn't happen, E is not, you know, this theorem is true for any set. And, and if this happens, this, the reason is that there is, the, the reason that you don't have randomness is some underlying algebraic structure. And this is, this is the theme between, behind, uh, behind this proof of, uh, of Furstenberg. Um, again, this, this led to an, an area of mathematics that, uh, that is called ergodic Ramsey theory and, and using ergodic theoretic methods to prove um, results in combinatorics. Um, maybe two, two uh, uh, highlighted results um, to, in, in this area. Is one is the multidimensional Samaritan theorem proved by Furstenberg and Katznelson in 1978. So it's a multidimensional version of this theorem and it took quite a, this, it took quite, a, quite, quite some time to find a combinatorial proof for this theorem. And, and the second one is the bergelson lehmann polynomial progression theorem, which uh, uh, I see, El, you're looking at me. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm finishing, it's my last slide. <laughs> uh, which showed that, uh, that, uh, uh, that subset of positive density contain arbitrarily long polynomial progressions. And this still doesn't have a combinatorial proof. So, so this, there, there's some, some partial results too, but, but not, uh, um, not in general. And, and again, um, uh, I think for, for a long time, um, people that were interested in these theorems were people from the dynamics community and people from combinatorics, but then, uh, but then came Green and Tao and, uh, and proved that actually um, one can use these ideas to prove that the prime numbers contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions and using many other ideas, but, but basic ideas come from this, this, uh, these, the, from ideas in ergodic theory. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and I should say on a, on a personal note that I actually, I remember this, uh, this paper coming out when I was a postdoc and I remember my excitement when I saw it. Uh, and I can only imagine the excitement of the ergodic and combinatorial community when they saw Furstenberg's paper and others' papers come out. So, so when you see something great coming out, then, then this is very exciting for, the, for people to see. Um, and then, yeah, and, and finally, uh, uh, one can use these uh, uh, ideas further to, 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 uh, um, to solve uh, uh, any finite complexity system of linear forms and primes. And, and, and into this comes dynamics and nil-manifold. So dynamics is really everywhere even in the prime numbers. And, uh, and with this, I am done. So normally I think people now uh, offer Corona beer at the end of a talk or something, but I offer you first number beer. So uh, thank you.